Hello, um, thanks for joining in and having a look at this webinar. My name is Yolanda Hannett and I'm a Sustainable Agriculture Facilitator with NRM South and I'll briefly talk us about the role and the placement of the different NRMs within Tasmania through in just a moment. Um, within my role I really support those managing the land within the agricultural areas and this has been quite an interest of mine for the last couple of years which also led me to undertaking a really great um, research and um, PhD project through an amazing team of entomologists at the University of Sydney. And that was funded through AgriFutures and was focusing on um, securing and supporting the pollination industry. So I'll be talking about some of the data that I collected um, through that process, but also some of the research question ideas that sort of were embedded along my way and are still embedded in the work that I do, really focusing on the role that native vegetation and diversity within production systems play to the sustainable and also productive values um, within our agricultural landscapes. So thank you very much for joining. And you'll also have, I'll also be sharing my contact details at the end of the presentation. So if you're interested um, to hear a little bit more or get some resources, please feel free to get in contact with me. Um, and thank you very much for joining in. Now, my position now where I work and how I'm doing this workshop and hopefully also be doing some more work around beneficial insects in the future is through my role with NRM South. Um, NRM stands for Natural Resource Management, Overall, there's three different NRMs. So the Southern Re in Tasmania, the Southern Region, NRM North, um, who some of you may also be involved with, and then also the Cradle Coast NRM. Um, and these three NRMs are then part of 54 different NRMs that are spread across um, all of Australia. And we're really there to sort of support the natural and cultural and social um, values that we have within our landscapes and within our communities. And I work within the agricultural landscape. Now, what I like us to sort of think about a little bit is um, when we sort of the broad topic of enhancing a landscape or enhancing a, a, a property or a garden or whatever it is that you're managing to enhance specific values. And we can see these values also as benefits benefits to us, benefits to the natural environment. And in that terms of values and benefits, we often also talk about ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are really those sort of services that we get from the natural environment around us to support different processes in terms of our agricultural landscapes, in terms of our um, um, even our urban landscapes. Um, but what I like to... I like to pull the sort of term of ecosystem services um, apart a little bit and talk about ecosystem services when I'm really talking about those services that we get from our natural environment that directly contribute or benefit to our agricultural production. So I'm sort of pulling out this one part and defining it in a specific way. Um, what stands sort of outside of that then to some, not outside of it, but is sort of separated in that thought process are uh, biodiversity services. So these are services that may not be con directly contributing to our um, agriculture production system, but are part of that sort of greater health of our natural environment. And the reason why I like to classify th these two things in this specific context of beneficial insects is because when we look at the sort of services or the benefits that we can get from insects, when we specifically now look at flower feeding insects, of course, on the one hand, we have these crop pollination services. So quite a number of the crops that we grow around the world now either require or benefit from insect pollination. So we get a much better um, fruit production or nut production if the flowers are pollinated by insects. Now, this other really important value that we get from insects in general, including flower feed, feeding insects and natural pest enemies. So we have these disservices where we have agricultural pests um, that are having a negative impact on our production systems, on the crops that we're growing. 
But then we also have these insects that actually predate on these pests. And what we see here in the terms of the flower feeding insects specifically, it's often the adult that uses nectar and at times also pollen as a source of energy. Um, and then it's the larva or with the lady beetles, also the adults that feed on agricultural pests. Now we also have all these other flower feeding insects within our, within our, within our landscapes. And some of them might not have that direct, or they might, they definitely don't have a direct impact to our production systems in terms of either crop pollinators or as natural pest enemies. An example for that is some of the native bee species that we have. And I'll talk in a minute about specialization and generalization. So this talks about what insects, what flowers different insects are attracted to. So, but it's still adding a biodiversity value, or we can talk about it about insect um, diversity, still adds these values to our greater health of our environments around us. One of sort of the very broad questions that I first thought about when I was sort of diving into um, defining my PhD topic was looking at different agricultural systems and then thinking, well, what different flowers are out there and what insects are attracted to specific flowers or why is an insect or what flower is a certain insect attracted to. Now, there's a whole sweep of different things that go on why a particular insect might be visiting a particular flower but are not a whole set of these other flowers that are around. One thing is morphology and that really on the one hand, also differentiates if we're looking at these different values. So whether an insect might be a crop pollinator or a natural pest enemy and what flowers it visits. And that comes down to mouth parts. So bees have specialised to feed only on flowers as a source, um, both for themselves and their young. Um, so they've been really specialised to collect pollen and they've also got specialised mouth parts, these long tongues that allow them to access flowers. Now, when we look at some of these other insects, and this is really falls in line with the natural pest enemies, they have not evolved to fully feed on flowers. So their mouth parts and the rest of their body hair and everything has also not evolved to just specialise on flowers. So we already have a variation here. And that can mean, and some of the data will also show that, that these open flowers, um, so for example, when we look at something like the flathead here or the daisy, um, these open flowers where, the, where insects can land and easily access nectaries, we have a whole sweep of different in insects that are even able to access the flowering resources in these flowers. Then we have restricted flowers and pea flowers, for example, where not every insect can get into the flower part. So we already have some variation in a very basic sort of structure of a flower. But then there's more intrinsic changes again, where we have variation in tongue length, for example, with bees, where only some bees are able to access the nectaries of some flowers compared to others. So we have some more broad variation in terms of different groups of insects, but we still have variation within insects. And then the list goes on and on and on where there's nutritional values and timing of flowers and different cues that flowers have to attract certain things. Um, and it's a complex and evolving sort of part of, of research of identifying and getting some themes and understanding. And why do we not wanna know all these things? Well, it comes down then to managing our landscapes and our resources in a certain way that we make sure we have that sweep of different flowers where we can feed some more specialised insects that might need particular flowers. And then we also have some for these other more specialised and then these generalised insects that can feed on a variety of different flowers. And again, when we look at it now from bees in terms of that foraging behaviour, in terms of this real generalisation, where we have insects that feed on a variety of different flowers. And apologies, I wanted to put labels on this and didn't get across to it. Um, honeybees and bumblebees are probably the most commonly known um, bees that we find in Tassie. Um, they're here in really large numbers. We probably have all seen them feeding on flowers um, in, in, in our environment around us. Um, they're both introduced species. 
And they're also bees that make big hives. So they make, um, they're found in really big numbers. They're also widely spread around the world to help with crop pollination services. One of their reason being that they're really generalized. They feed on heaps and heaps and heaps of different flowers, which makes them suitable to help with the pollination of many different crops. We do also have some native bees within our environment though. So we have around 120 different native bee species in Tasmania. Um, all of them though are either solitary or have very early stages of some kind of social interaction, but they don't make hives. So we're also never going to see them often in numbers that are as big as we see with their honey and bumblebees because of the way that their populations will never grow as big. Um, some of them do feed on quite a variety of different flowers, but other native bees that we have are really specialised. And there's been some great work by Julian Brown um, summarising this a little bit and what his data is showing and also coincides with some of the earlier findings of naturalists that have studied native bees in the Australian landscape is that we have um, a link of specialization likely towards more old lineages or Gondwanan plant species and um, with more Gondwanan old lineages of bees. And then we have new arrivals of bee and new arrivals of plant species and they have less specialization. And that means also that these plant species that have very recently arrived in Australia um, through European settlement means that the bees that don't have that high specializations are also ones that are potential to help us with our crop pollination. Now, one of the study systems that I looked at during my PhD was orchards. Um, so this included apple and blueberry orchards and this data was collected in southern Tasmania in the sort of channel, so Kingborough and Hewan area. And what I was really interested in um, which was really baseline insight because it hadn't been collected in the Tassie landscape, is looking at, well, I've got my flowering crops. What's visiting my crops? Um, what else is in flower? There's some native vegetation in flower. There's some exotic vegetation in flower. What's visiting these different plant species and how are they? how are these sort of interacting and connected? And what you get when you throw all your data together is what we call networks. And this is um, overall data collected at six di different apple orchards and five different blueberry orchards. So just combined. One thing that we can see uh, at the top here, we have our plant species. At the bottom, we have the, um, at the bottom, we have the insect species. And what we can see is that honeybees really dominated the pollination. So there was a really high percentage of the visits that are recorded to apple flowers that were by honeybees. And similar was also seen for blueberries. Bumblebees, so this is our secondary um, introduced bee species that we have in Tassie. Um, they, did, they were feeding quite frequently on blueberry, um, but not very much on apple. So overall what this means is that the crop pollination of apple really relies at the moment on honeybees. Now, bumblebees during the time of flowering of these two crops are in a stage where there's actually mainly queens out. So bumblebees hibernate over winter, and this is a, a, a fertilised um, or a reproduced female that goes and hibernates over winter and then emerges in spring, and she goes out, starts foraging, makes a nest, starts laying her eggs, and then we see workers come out, and that's when we see a colony structure. So overall, at this time of the year, spring flowering, there's not that many bumblebees overall in the landscape, but they definitely love blueberry, and it coincided with data from outside of so outside of Australia, including the US and Europe, where bumblebees are really attracted to blueberries. Now, I did see um, two native bees quite common within these production system. On the one hand, these were Axonera, also known as Rees bees. The other one, Lazia glossums, which are little grey soil nesting bees. Um, Axonera was quite attracted to both apple and blueberry and was otherwise found mainly feeding on native vegetation, whereas these soil nesting bees were 
quite attracted to exotic forbs, so things like Asteracea and Brassica that are sort of flowering on the often in the grassy rows between the orchards or on the end, um, and also found on native vegetation. And a great thing of some research that was conducted in New South Wales, um, they studied and looked at how efficient, so how good are um, native bees compared to honeybees at pollinating um, apple flowers. And they found Exoneura and Lasioglossum were both really good. So they're good at pollinating apple, which is really great. It means they are attracted to this crop, but they're also good at this, uh, good at pollinating apple. But when you look at the overall um, effectiveness, so they're efficient at it, but the overall effectiveness or the overall impact that um, these native bees have on the crop pollination is much smaller compared to honeybees because we find honeybees in much greater number. So you might have 100 visits of honeybees, but you only have 10 visits of native bees. So the overall contribution of honeybees is still really important in the pollination of these crops. But then when we go back to this sort of value of different vegetation types on our crops and how they're linked, um, what it what my data showed in these orchards is that exotic forbs was really good at promoting um so these little soil nesting, lazy glossums, honeybee, and also hoverflies. Well, someone else is just coming in. Let's just let them in and continue talking. So um yeah, so it was really showing this 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 connection between the two uh, between the oh sorry <laughs> just lost my train of thought. Yeah, so the exotic vegetation was really supporting the soil nesting bees, um, honeybees, and then also the hoverflies. And when we talked about natural pest enemies before, hoverflies are an example of a natural pest enemy where. <clears throat> With, particularly when we look at aphids, and they can also help in the pollination of crops. So the exotic vegetation in that sense um, with, around the production system, so this is things like clover or your esteraceae, um, and some people also put in some sort of brassicas within a bit of a cover crop between the rows. They really help to, in terms of our crop pollination services when we think about our honeybees. And they also have potentially have a secondary value of boosting some of the aphids within um, those production systems, so helping some natural pest enemies at the same time. But then when we look at these other bees, so these are these reed bees, the native bees that was most attracted to visit apple, but also visiting blueberries, they weren't really interested in the exotic forms. And this included, so I collected data during bloom and I collected data around a month and a half after the bloom was over. So when we only have this vegetation around our um, orchard crops that don't have native vegetation, we're really missing the one native bee that is most attracted to our crop. And that's what this role of the native vegetation then has. Um, it gives the secondary um, or the um, a flower resource outside of crop bloom to reed bees, which is our native bees that were attracted to the crop. But then we also, when I talked about this specialization before, um, it was really important for those insects that are not attracted to exotic forbs, they're not attracted to our crop. They're just not going to be attracted to our introduced plant species because they have specialized towards um, more ancient plant species within, um, within Australia. At the same time, there was also the hoverflies, so the natural pest enemies that were also feeding on the flowers, and the honeybee being a highly generalised species was also found on this vegetation type. Now, when we look at the sec another value of the native vegetation, apart from being a flower, resources, flower resource for reed bees, they also play a really important role as a nesting resource. Now, Julian Brown has done some landscape analysis in Victoria, where we see a similar overlap with um, Axoneura. And they found that um, landscapes that have had a very small proportion of native vegetation also had a very small proportion of reed bees. Um, so this is Axoneura compared to landscapes that had a lot of native vegetation. And one of the reasons, is, or the reason in terms of a nesting resource is that apple being a hardwood doesn't have the ability 
to be used as a nesting resource um, for resource, uh, for exodura that need a pithy stem. Native vegetation that they do use is tree ferns, for example. There is, however, an introduced plant that we also use within our cropping system that can be used by reed bees, and these are different cane berries or if you think raspberry boys and berries, but then of course are also blackberries, which is which are often found as a weed. Now, no way am I am telling people that they should leave all their blackberries around because reed bees love them. <laughs> um, but it's just a thing to think about or when you're removing something, but also when you're adding or potentially have a mixed cropping system where you're thinking, well, I have my apples and then if I have my raspberries next to them, which actually flower, sort of start flowering when the apple starts finishing, I'm prolonging my flora resources for a native bee that's helping with my crop pollination at the same time, I'm also supplying them with a nesting resource. Um, and then again, that value of um, native vegetation as well, retaining it, enhancing it in the landscape for these very different um, benefits that we can get from native vegetation. And this was a specific sort of example around an orchard system. Another way people have been looking at enhancing nesting resources for reed bees is putting out some artificial nesting resources. So this can be things like bamboo stems, for example, that have the pithiness, um, cutting them and then placing them around. It's sort of also used often in terms of insect hotels that um, people put out to have some nesting resources for um, insects. And that can include the bamboo for the reed bees, which help with the pollination of some of our fruit crops. Now, the other study systems that I looked at were market gardens. Um, so this is uh, like diverse cropping system where a variety of different crops are grown. Now, what I'm showing here at the moment, I sort of classified plant species into different broad categories. And I classified things as crops, as plants that are pretty much sold post their flowering stage. So these are things like our different percubits, our fabaceae, our nightshades, some of it which require, fully require crop pollination for successful fruit production. So things like our zucchinis and pumpkins, and then things that have at uh, times a bit like definitely benefit from crop pollination of insects. So berries and strawberries and solanaceas, there's a variation with some not requiring um, and some still in terms of chili, for example, there's some studies showing, well, you still get a better a better fruit product if they are crop pollinated. And here again, um, we see that these two introduced bee species really made up the bulk of the overall visitation. So this is not efficiency data. This is just purely based on the amount of visits different crop flowers received when they were visited by honeybees and bumblebees. And this again was collected in Tasmania, uh, mainly farms down south, but also a few farms up in the northern parts of Tasmania. Um, we see a much larger proportion of bumblebees now, and this is when we start seeing a lot of the workers come out. So queens are quite big, and then we have the workers that are um, that are smaller, particularly the early emerging ones, and then the ones afterwards get a sort of intermediate size. Um, when we look at the variation between honeybees and bumblebees, quite a big overlap on the different crops that they visited, apart from our night nightshades. And this really comes down to bumblebees' ability to buzz. Buzzing is vibrating your body, which is needed to release the pollen out of nightshade flowers, which we, um, which is not an ability that the honeybees can do. Now, when we look at other insects, much smaller proportion, but we still get some native bees that are visiting the crops, and this is particularly in the berry and strawberry and the berries were sort of raspberry and boysenberries and a few blackberries. And these, again, was mainly reed bees that were visiting um, these um, crops. Um, but then when we look at these other crops, particularly things, including things in the curcubit and nightshade family, there was occasional visit, but they're very, very, very infrequent. So there wasn't sort of that trend that they seem to like a particular um, or pre often found on a particular flowering resource. Now, when I talked about, well, there's also these other broad character, ca ca characters, categories, thank you, Yolanda, 
um, of flowering resources that we find within these production system, the broad sort of variation that I did is that I said, okay, I have my flowers that are in the production system because they're crops. They're crops and with crop in that sense, it's crop that are sold post their flowering stage. Um, but then I also I have um, different flowering plants within my production system which I now, uh, which are classified crops post their harvesting stage. Um, and apologies, I later changed this again, again in the thesis because there is some sort of um, confusion potentially what I mean between the two. But really what I mean with that is it, it's a crop that is no longer sold or no longer has a big value in being sold once it went to flower. So prime example are things like carrots, brassicas and leeks. So these plants wouldn't be sold once they went to flower. Why are they found within the production system once they went to flower? Well, one reason might be because you want to save them for seed. Um, but often when I spoke to people is also this mindset of, well, I wanted to, I want to increase the flowering resources within my production system. And a lot of the organic and permaculture Books um, and resources that you read um, also say that that's a way that you can boost your beneficials by letting some of your crops go to flower. Of course, other times it's just because I forgot to pull the last bit of that crop out, so it just stayed behind and, and went fallow and went to flower. And then uh, there's incidental or weedy plant species that are found within the production rows but also in the sort of grassy, so similar composition of plant species as we find in the grassy areas around orchards as well. Now, when we look at this variation between, yeah, we still have a lot of honeybee and bumblebees, but this is now where we see a lot more diversity and a much greater number of different insects are not found on these different crops that we're growing, but all these other flowering plant species that we have. And particularly these crops post a harvesting stage and so things in the um in the sort of humble open flower shape, easy access for insects that have less modified mouth parts that allow them to feed on flowers, which are also our natural pest enemies. So things like hoverflies, lady beetle, beetles, wasps. I unfortunately only got a small a small number of data on wasps, but we also have a lot of small parasitoid wasps that are hard to see with the with just using visual observation. But this is where we're boosting our number of different insects, including our natural pest enemies, also including our um, native bees that weren't really that attracted to the different crops that were in flower, but are still part, some of them part of directly contributing to or potentially directly contributing to our production system, but also being part of a greater set of diversity within our landscapes. Other things that were really attracted to native bees were different flowering herbs, so thyme, basil, all those different things that we have in our production system, and also some of the ornamental um, plant species that were found. Um, but there was a bit of a variation that, for example, something like zinnias weren't really that attracted to, to much other than honeybees and, unfortunately, cabbage wides, but then some of the smaller um plant species and smaller sort of esteraceae such as um chamomile for example that then had a much more different variation on what it was found what was found feeding on them and really if you have flowering plants in your garden or in your on your property i really also encourage you to keep a little bit of an eye out lady beetles are really easy thing to spot um what are they feeding on what flowers do i find them on and then have a bit of a play around of leaving some of those flowers there to have a flower resource for for those different insects. Now, when we look at the sort of value then of our, um, in terms of why might I want to enhance or change or put in different flowering resources, if we look at, well, we're only going to focus on having all these flowering crop because I work in the market gardens and there's heaps of flowering plants around and I have all these different flowers from my crops. Well, if you're growing a lot of curcubits and um, and other nightshades and nightshades and um, fabaceae, you're 
pretty much in terms of the flowering resources you're giving, mainly attracting these um, native bees because they're the only ones attracted to the crops. There isn't, compared to the apple flowers where we had native bees that were attracted to it, we just don't have native bees attracted to that crop. So when we look at also the value being like, well, I want to do all these things to attract more pollinator to that crop, that's just not going to work because the insects are just not attracted to that crop. And that's fine. That's just the way the way our 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 systems work <laughs> let's say it that way um but then when we look at the value of adding floral resources on the one hand it's really of course these secondary or these these other benefits these biodiversity benefits um that we're ha having within our system so this could include letting things go to flower but also integrating some native vegetation around your production system Another thing to think about is that we're seeing more and more threats to honeybees, particularly now with the arrival of varroamide, that most likely at some point will make its way to um, Tasmania, which could really have a quite detrimental effect on our honeybee populations. On the one hand, a decline of our feral honeybee populations, but also this importance of keeping our managed honeybees healthy and happy within our particularly agricultural production system where we need them for crop pollination, but we also want them as healthy and happy as possible. So having a variety of different flowering resources available to them is really a critical component to help our crop pollination in the long run as well. And then that value that I talked about before of the values that flower add to help our natural pest enemies. And this, on the one hand, is then when we look at um, different um, native be native plant species that we can add. Um, and there was someone that contacted me earlier on whose name, unfortunately, forgot, and they said they were growing a lot of Bezeria spinosa. Um, and uh, I often talk about this with Pinastronic from Landcare. We want to have a Bezeria spinanza party, and we just want people to grow a bunch of different Bezerias, Bezeria on their properties. And one of the reasons is that it, it's found to, it, it's useful for honey production. Um, so you might get a value from that, but it's really some research has shown um, in vineyards through Retala vineyards um, in South Australia that it helps to boost natural pest enemies in a um, vineyard system. And it would likely also help natural pest enemies in other systems, um, such, a, such as a market garden or orchard. Now, that doesn't mean that Bezerra is the only plant, native plant species that, that fits that category. It's just one that has been found through research and similar to Leptospermum. And again, open access. So we get our different critters that don't have modified mouth parts to be able to access the flowering resources in those flowers compared to beautiful pea flowers where some of the... Um, um, where bees can access the nectaries really easy, other insects are restricted. They're not able to access the flowering resources in these flowers, but then they have a really important role to play to feed certain native bees that are quite attracted to these um, plant species. Um, native plant species are, are, are great in that sense. They feed, um, they, they are linked to certain insects and they're part of that greater biodiversity system. But that doesn't mean that um, native introduced plant species are only used by introduced bees. So you still get, um, and one example that I'd, if you if you do have it in your garden or you want to play around a bit, um, are these umble shaped flowers. So of course, carrot is part of it, but there's also Queen's Anne's Lace or Falls Queen's Anne's Lace that has these umble shaped flowers. And they've been, when I when I surveyed them in market gardens, this is really where I saw an explosion of different insects, including native bees and beetles and, and wasps and flies feeding on these flowers. And it's quite fascinating when you take a moment and look, and you, even if you just count things that look different and you start seeing a lot of different things feeding feeding on them. Um, but saying that, also things within the Asteraceae Family on Lamiaceae, so these are, are different herbs, often also attract quite a wide variety of different insects. Um, the cross out or the cross out was just that when we look at natural pest enemies, some plants are restricted. Now, when we think about integrating, like how can I maybe integrate different flowers around my production system to get different um, and varied values? And when I tried to find a little bit of an example and played around on the internet, I found Lansdowne vine 
um, and this sort of schematic that they put out on as part of their promotion on their website. And I just thought, yeah, this is great. So we what we what 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 they did here is on the one hand they planted out things around a waterway, um, and yeah, we have we in that way increase our flowering resources and also nesting and habitat resources for different beneficial insects. But at the same time, I'm also protecting a water course. So um, really, when you think about, particularly when you think about adding native vegetation in your production system, think about these different benefits. Um, you might have a, a riparian line that lies along. It's like, okay, great. I can I can protect a waterway whilst at the same time I'm adding adding um, flowers for that can maybe help with my pollination or my pest control. And I'm also adding resources to um, birds so there's once you start looking into it there's a potential it doesn't mean that everything's in every situation in the landscape is going to tick all those boxes but it has the possibility and that's really really quite exciting another thing that they do do around vineyard which would be interesting also to potentially integrate in something like a market garden is integrating some plant species at the end of the row so this includes things like the Bush and Bizarius spinosis, and they're adding them at the end of their production rows. They can have a bit of a movement and attract native insect, oh, attract insects within the production system. But then they also have a mix. So they have these native plant species that they're adding, and then they have facilia and buckwheat. So these are introduced plant species known to be quite attractive for insects outside of so facilia and is from um, America, and I think buckwheat may also be or European plant species. Us growing, um, potentially easier adopted in modified land in modified sort of soils that you're working with in a production system, and you can also more easily change them. So if you're only leasing land, or myself um, being in rental properties, adding native vegetation might not be an option. These woody plant species, so you can also add things that are introduced plant species to boost some of these values within your production system and and your overall landscape. This is just a little bit of a list of plant species. I got contacted by someone a couple of weeks ago being like, oh, can you recommend some plants to enhance um, native bees on my property? And I was like, well, I mean, there's 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 varied. As I said, there's don't don't be don't be narrow minded when you look at what plant species so you can find lists and I do have some recommendations on lists including this or some other resources you look into but if you are interested in in adding or managing something on your property just also work with what's available work with what's on hand and and often um you already have a bunch of different flowers that are found on your property so making sure you might want to take out the weeds that might be suppressing suppressing them and so forth. But this is just a bit of a variety and sort of highlighting through that as well, variation of shapes and sizes. One thing you can also think about is like, oh, do I have different plant families plant um, with represented in the different plants or am I just got a whole bunch of um, native peas, for example? It's like, no, I've got some native peas, I've got some metaceae there. And then you can also think about different timings. So these might be flowering in spring, other might be flowering in summer. And, in, and then think also about fast growing, like um, Godinia hovata is a plant species that grows really fast. It's like, great, I also get a, a, a sort of um, quicker benefit myself from, from seeing some of the changes that I'm implementing compared to if I'm putting in a bunch of eucalypts where I have to wait quite a long time before they go to flower. And this might also be interesting for people that are working with kids. Um, another thing to think about when you're integrating native vegetation, as I said, potentially some riparian areas um, that you want to be planting out, um, planting out with um, native vegetation to sort of stop risks of erosion and protect the waterway. Um, but then also if you're working in, a, in, in your garden or on your property, you might be needing or wanting to, to undertake changes. So this could be putting in more production area in a certain area, or it could be around um, weed control. So you might be removing some woody weeds. Um, and then um, and then that's as a secondary element, that's also that area where you're going to start planting out some of the native vegetation. So you start having a cover and supp suppressing the weeds that you're putting into that area. I'm just going to skip over this one, actually. 
Um, some of the resources that I can recommend. So NRM North has this um, small holding property managing workbook. If you haven't looked at that, that's just sort of a nice way and, and holistic way to sort of step through different parts of managing your property. The Natural Farm Assets book was put out by David Lindenmeyer through um, a project called Sustainable Farms, a new project. Really that overall thinking about different values can get from the, enhancing and protect and, and managing the native vegetation around your property. It's a really um, lovely book, but there's also a bunch of free resources on the Sustainable Farms website in terms of PDFs. So I recommend having a look at them as well. Um, same free resources is through Ecovenience and um, Powerful Pollinators is through the Wean Bee Foundation. Okay, that brings us to the end of the presentation. And as you can see here are my contact details. So both via email at myhannish.nrmsouth.org.au and also my phone number. Um, so feel free to get in touch if you have any sort of specific questions around the talk. As this is an online recording, I can't take your questions in person, but do feel free to be in contact with me and there might be something I can help you with um, within the future. Um, I can also, if you want any of the resources or links, please feel free to email me and I'll send them through to you um, after. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.